Rusty and Mr. Harrison met in front of the town's main grocery store, the wine and general merchants. It was part of the smart shopping center, alien to the bazaar but far from the European community, and thus neutral ground for Rusty and Mr. Harrison. Hello, Mr. Harrison, said Rusty, confident of himself and deliberately omitting the customary sir. Mr. Harrison tried to ignore the boy, but found him blocking the way to the car. Not wishing to lose his dignity, he decided to be pleasant. This is a surprise, he said. I never thought I'd see you again. I found a job, said Rusty, taking the opportunity of showing his independence. I meant to come and see you, but didn't get the time. You're always welcome. The missionary's wife often speaks of you. She'd be glad to see you. By the way, what's your job? Rusty hesitated. He did not know how his guardian would take the truth, probably with a laugh or a sneer, yet teaching, and decided to be mysterious about his activities. Babysitting, he replied, with a disarming smile. Anyway, I'm not starving, and I've got many friends. Mr. Harrison's face darkened, and the corners of his mouth twitched. But he remembered that times had changed, and that Rusty was older and also free, and that he wasn't in his own house, and he controlled his temper. Mr. Harrison's face darkened, and the corners of his mouth twitched. But he remembered that times had changed, and that Rusty was older and also free, and that he wasn't in his own house, and he controlled his temper. I can get you a job, he said, on a tea estate, or if you like to go abroad, I have friends in Guyana. I like babysitting, said Rusty. Mr. Harrison smiled, got into the car, and lit a cigarette before starting the engine. Well, as I said, you're always welcome in the house. Thanks, said Rusty. Give my regards to the sweeper boy. The atmosphere was getting tense. Why don't you come and see him sometime, said Mr. Harrison, as softly and as malevolently as he could. It was just as well the engine had started. I will, said Rusty. I kicked him out said Mr. Harrison, putting his foot down on the accelerator and leaving Rusty in a cloud of dust. But Rusty's rage turned to pleasure when the car almost collided with a stationary block cart, and a uniformed policeman brought it to a halt. With the feeling that he had been the master of the situation, Rusty walked homewards. The lychee trees were covered with their pink-skinned fruit and the mangoes were almost ripe. The mango is a passionate fruit, its inner gold sensuous to the lips and tongue. The grass had not yet made up its mind to remain yellow or turn green and would probably keep its dirty color until the monsoon rains arrived. Mina met Rusty under the banana trees. I'm bored, she said. So I am going to give you a haircut. Do you mind? I will do anything to please you, but don't take it all off. Don't you trust me? I love you. Rusty was wrapped up in a sheet and placed on a chair. He looked up at Mina and their eyes met, laughing, blue and brown. Mina cut silently and the fair hair fell quickly, softly, lightly to the ground. Rusty enjoyed the snip of the scissors and the sensation of lightness. It was as though his mind was being given more room in which to explore. Kishan came loafing around in the corner of the house, still wearing his pajamas, which were rolled up to the knees. When he saw what was going on, he burst into laughter. And what's so funny? said Rusty. You, spluttered Kishan. Where is your hair? Your beautiful golden hair. Has mummy made you become a monk? Or have you got ringworm or fleas? Look at the ground, all that beautiful hair. 
Don't be funny, Kishan Bhaiya, said Meena, or you will get the same treatment. Is it so bad? asked Rusty anxiously. Don't you trust me? said Meena. I love you. Meena glanced swiftly at Kishan to see if he had heard the last remark. But he was still laughing at Rusty's haircut and prodding his nose for all he was worth. Rusty, I have a favor to ask you, said Meena. Mr. Kapoor and I may be going to Delhi for a few weeks, as there is a chance of him getting a good job. We are not taking Kishan Bhaiya, as he is only nuisance value. So will you look after him and keep him out of mischief? I will leave some money with you. About how much will you need for two weeks? When are you going? Asked Rusty, already in the depths of despair. How much will you need? Oh, fifty rupees. But when? A hundred rupees, interrupted Kishin. Oh boy, Rusty will have fun. Seventy-five, said Mina, as though driving a bargain. And I'll send more after two weeks. But we should be back by then. There, Rusty, your haircut is complete. But Rusty wasn't interested in the result of the haircut. He felt like sulking. He wanted to have some say in Mina's plans. He felt he had a right to a little power. That evening, in the front room, he didn't talk much. Nobody spoke. Kishen lay on the ground, stroking his stomach, his toes tracing imaginary patterns on the wall. Mina looked tired. Wisps of hair had fallen across her face, and she did not bother to brush them back. She took Kishen's foot and gave it a pull. Go to bed, she said. Not tired. Go to bed or you'll get a slap. Kishan laughed defiantly, but got up from the floor and ambled out of the room. And don't wake daddy, she said. Kapoor had been put to bed early, as Meena wanted him to be fresh and sober for his journey to Delhi and his interviews there. But every now and then he would wake up and call out for something. Something unnecessary, so that after a while, no one paid any attention to his requests. He was like an irritable, invalid, to be humored and tolerated. Are you not feeling well, Mina? asked Rusty. If you like, I'll also go. I'm only tired, don't go. She went to the window and drew the curtains and put out the light. Only the table lamp burned. The lampshade was decorated with dragons and butterflies. It was a Chinese lampshade. And as Rusty sat gazing at the light, the dragons began to move and the butterflies flutter. He couldn't see Mina, but felt her presence across the room. She turned from the window and silently, with hardly a rustle, slipped to the ground her back against the couch, her head resting against the cushion. She looked up at the ceiling. Neither of them spoke. From the next room came sounds of Kishan preparing for the night. One or two thumps and a muttered imprecation. Kapoor snored quietly to himself and the rest was silence. Rusty's gaze left the revolving dragons and prancing butterflies to settle on Mina, who sat still and tired, her feet lifeless against the table legs, her slippers fallen to the ground. In the lamplight, her feet were like jade. A moth began to fly round the lamp, and it went round and round and closer, till, with a sudden plop, it hit the lampshade and fell to the ground. But Rusty and Mina were still silent, their breathing the only conversation.